Greetings and salutations. I hope this video finds you doing well. Today we're going to talk about 45s, one of my favorite things in the world. In the last few videos that I have done about phono cartridges, I've talked about advanced stylus shapes like microline, shibata, vivid line, and whatnot not being the greatest choice for playing back 45s. And the reason why is because some 45s are not made out of vinyl. Not all records are made out of vinyl, kids. All the millennials want to call records vinyls. <laughs> I hate that. The first time I ever heard anybody call a record vinyl was in 1984, and it was a radio commercial for a CD player. And they were talking about how the CD player was better than any conventional vinyl record. That's the first time I ever heard anybody say that. And these days, well, anyway get off my lawn, right? So before you, you have two copies of the same record. And one of them is pressed on polyvinyl chloride, and one of them is pressed on polystyrene, actually molded with polystyrene. We'll talk about the process here in just a little bit. How do you tell which is which? Well, the first tip-off is the weight. Vinyl is heavier than polystyrene. So after a while, you could probably just pick a record up and figure it out by the weight. Um, the other thing to look for is the label. On a vinyl record, it's pressed. Vinyl, when you get it hot, doesn't liquefy. It just becomes like a goo. So in order to make a record out of it, whether it be a 12-inch or a 7-inch record, you have to have a press that pushes down with a great deal of force, and it actually causes that vinyl to flow into the mold all the way out to the edge. Whereas with polystyrene, the uh, records are injection molded. There's very little pressure, okay? When they make a vinyl record, the label is put on first and it is pressed into the record. So if you take your fingernail and try and get up under the edge, you can't do it because it's pressed down into the vinyl. Also on a vinyl record, the edges are sometimes, uh, they have a little curve on them where the mold kind of cuts it off on the edges. Whereas on a styrene record, it will be a squared off edge which is very smooth. And the label, you can almost get your fingernail up under it because with a styrene record, the label is added afterwards and it's just glued on, that's it. So I haven't really pointed it out yet, but this is the vinyl version of this. This is the styrene version. And some of you guys, if you're 45 collectors, have probably picked that up just by looking at the video. You didn't have to touch the record. Because another weird thing about polystyrene versus vinyl is that the light on the grooves has a different look to it. Uh, the grooves just, uh, they, they almost look like they're raised up above the surface on polystyrene, whereas on vinyl, they're kind of sunk down in. It just looks different. So why does this matter? It matters because vinyl lasts longer with continuous play than polystyrene. You got to remember that when 45s were originally issued, it was all about speed. If it was a new song, the record company wanted to get it out to the jukeboxes, wanted to get it out into the record stores, and get it out to radio stations. And yes, they did make special promo records for radio. That's an entirely different story. But a lot of the times, smaller radio stations didn't get them promo records. If they had a record service, they got a stock 45, just like you would buy. And so who pressed it was all a matter of who could do it fastest, especially in the 70s and 80s. And different independent record companies would just call up and say, I've got an order, how quick can you get it out? And if, for, for instance, like RCA generally pressed vinyl, 
then they, if they would contract with RCA or one of the other uh, pressing plants that used vinyl. And uh, if it was um, Columbia, for instance, Columbia Records, any distribution that Columbia did, so it would be Columbia and Epic and all the other sub-labels that Columbia had, they had their own pressing plants and they used polystyrene. And uh, there are some advantages to polystyrene for the pressing people. Uh, first of all, the stampers last longer because there's less pressure involved. It's just an injection mold. Whereas with vinyl, because of all the pressure that's used, you can probably press about 10,000 copies, and then after that, the stamper gets damaged, uh, the grooves get distorted, and then you, you start hearing problems with the sound. The, the uh, actual metal stamper itself just it wears out. Whereas with polystyrene, the number that you can use before the stamper goes bad is much, much higher because there's relatively less pressure there. Uh, I think polystyrene is a cheaper material cost-wise than vinyl. I think that's another reason why they did it. And if the record was a hit, you got to remember, they would press millions and millions and millions of them. So every little bit adds up. For collectors these days, the big deal is, is that when you play back these records, if you play back a polystyrene record with... Uh, a stylus that is uh, sharp edged and that would be an advanced shape like a Shibata, Microline, Vividline. Uh, it starts ripping this polystyrene apart. It just doesn't have the same tensile strength as vinyl. And it's the modulation in the record that does it. Somebody had posted in a video, they said, well, or, or a comment that posted on a video where I mentioned this before and says, well, if you have a conical stylus, it's a smaller contact area, it would seem that that would be more uh, deleterious to records than, is that, a, that, that the right word? <laughs> I don't know <laughs> where that came from. That's a good word, though. I'll have to look that up. It would be uh, more destructive, I guess, to records than uh, a microline or an elliptical stylus, which theoretically has a bigger contact area. That's true. But we're not talking about a smooth groove here. What we're talking about is modulation. And that, that stylus moving back and forth, and on a stereo record, it's moving kind of up and down in all, in all kinds of directions. Uh, the G-forces that are generated at, let's say, like 12,000 cycles per second, which would be a, a 12 kilohertz tone that that's moving, uh, that's measured in the tons. Um, so that's why there's a problem. So with polystyrene records, it's best to play them with a conical or very mild elliptical. And of course, you do not want to have excessive tracking force. Like even with a conical, I'd say the limit would be three grams. You don't want anything over that. So you, you want a cartridge that's going to track at three grams or under. Um, it always blows my mind because I'm a member of a lot of collectors groups, like people who collect 45s and I'll see pictures they'll put up of them playing these very rare records that they paid a lot of money for on like a Crosley Cruiser, which was, you know, they track at nine grams with a sapphire stylus. They're groove chewers. If you care anything about your records, LPs, 45s, whatever, don't play them on that. It's just, no. I mean, I draw the line at having a magnetic cartridge, and like I said, three to four grams would be the absolute, you know, most. So if you have like a Audio-Technica LP60X turntable, which is the cheapest one they make, you're still okay to play your 45s. It won't tear them up too much. So there's some lore about polystyrene. One of them is that Motown supposedly never pressed on polystyrene. And I had an engineer friend of mine, an acquaintance who worked at Motown, he was a mastering engineer there, who had said that Barry Gordy Jr. hated the idea of pressing on styrene. They wanted to use a lot of modulation on their records. They didn't want them to wear out quickly in jukeboxes. And he tried to always press on vinyl. So for a number of years, I thought that a Motown uh, styrene record didn't exist. And I mentioned that in a video about 10 years ago. 
And a friend of mine out on the West Coast who uh, lived near Monarch uh, Pressing Plant, which is in Los Angeles, sent me this one. This is a Motown record on polystyrene. It's the Jacksons' Dancing Machine. This was a number one song. And obviously at that time, they were trying to get the product out, and they had to uh, get Monarch to press it for the West Coast because that's where he got it. And uh, there you go. When polystyrene records wear out, they have a very unique hashy sound to them. It's called run-through. That's the sound. And it usually you hear it on jukeboxes and you can't see it. So sometimes you'll see a record advertised as very good or like new and the person has not played it if you're buying it like on eBay and you get it and it's unlistenable. And that's because it's probably been in a jukebox. So... Uh, Beyond just polystyrene and vinyl for the differences in records, um, it's kind of interesting to note, I just for fun at the end here, let's talk about Capitol Records real quick. They're real easy to spot. A Capitol Record, and this is uh, Thomas Dolby's Blinded Me With Science, um, has a ridge around the label. See it right here? And the idea was, is on the old changers, that this would stack and grip, right, and the records wouldn't slip. This was a gimmick that Capitol came up with in the late 60s. And all through the 70s and well into the 80s, uh, they pressed records like this. And uh, Capitol not only pressed their own records, uh, but they pressed for a lot of independent record companies. So here is a Warner label record, uh, Donald Fagan here. One of my favorite songs, by the way, that is pressed by Capitol, and it's real easy to see because we have this ridge here. It's a completely different specification than regular 45s, and I point that out because you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> it depends on the record company and who they could get to press it the quickest. Uh, chances are, if the record is on Columbia, it's going to be on Styrene because they had their in-house pressing plants. And if it's on capital, it's going to be on vinyl, and it's going to be pressed with uh, this special uh, press that they had. Independent record companies, Atlantic, Electra, like we have here, a and uh, MCA, uh, you don't know what you're going to get. MCA generally pressed on vinyl up until they were merged, well, up until they merged with ABC in 1979, and after they did that, they pretty much contracted with anybody. So like an MCA-labeled record from the 80s in the U.S., it could be on vinyl or it could be on uh, polystyrene. You won't know until you uh, actually pick up the record and hold it and look at it. Um, some records in the 80s were pressed on Quiex vinyl. I've got a couple. Mercury seemed to be doing that. I've got a couple of Mercury label records that were uh, pressed on uh, Quiex 2 vinyl, which is supposed to be quieter than regular vinyl. Um, but Mercury also used polystyrene, regular vinyl, wh whatever they could get a hold of. Uh, Polygram, Polydor uh, records in the U.S. generally were on polystyrene, but not always. I've seen vinyl as well. So you just don't know what you're going to get until you actually see the record. So anyway, I thought this would be interesting to share. People have asked about this. and Another question that I keep getting lately is, is which is better, CDs or records? And I think that's its own video. I might do that somewhere down the road because I have a lot to say about that. But the word better is subjective, okay? What is better for you depends on what you like, what you dislike. Uh, I will say this. The sound that you get from CDs and records is different. I appreciate both. Depends on what mood I'm in that day. I don't really go through and say, well, this is better than that. And I, at, at one time years ago, I think I might have said that when I was really back into uh, records because I was so astonished at how much I was enjoying it, I said it was quote unquote better. But after some thought, um, I don't really look at it that way anymore. It's just whatever you enjoy. I love records. I love 45s. I collect them. Um, I want to say a big shout out at the end here to Phil. He's got a 
YouTube channel called Hitstown USA. He shares his collection. He's got all kinds of great records from the 50s all the way through the 2000s, uh, 45s, 12-inch promos, picture discs, all kinds of stuff. I also want to say hi to Spencer. He's got the WABC Radio 77 channel, another of my favorites. He shares a lot of records from the 60s and 70s and a little bit of 80s as well. So uh, if you don't have a big collection of 45s and you'd like to look at somebody else's, there's some channels for you to look at. Just wanted to throw that out there. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this at least somewhat interesting. Uh, I don't get to share this with too many folks, so I figured I would put it in a video. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks.